Hello everyone, um, welcome to this linear webinar. My name is Lottie Howard Merrill and I'm the research assistant for the Learning Initiative on Norms, Exploitation and Abuse, or LINEA, which sits within the Gender Violence and Health Centre at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, or LSHTM. As I'm sure you already know, LINEA is an international and multi-pronged project looking at how social norms theory can be used to prevent the sexual exploitation and abuse of children and adolescents globally. We're really thrilled to present some LINEA research uh, for you today. And this is also the last linear, for webin linear webinar for 2019, and it's entitled Social Norms Linked to the Sexual Exploitation of Children and Adolescents, a Global Systematic Review. So the presenter for today is my colleague, Marjorie Pichon. She's a research assistant for the Gender Violence and Health Centre at LSHTM. And this is one of two systematic reviews that Marjorie has been working on in her role at LSHTM. Um, the other one is a part of a project on the mechanisms and pathways of romantic jealousy and infidelity in intimate partner violence. Marjorie has an MSc in public health from LSHTM and a BA in psychology from Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. She also previously worked at the Institute of Medicine's Board on Population Health and Public Health Practice in Washington, D.C. We're also joined today by Dr. Maria, Dr. Anna Maria Bella, who's the Lanier Principal Investigator and the Deputy Director of the Gender Violence and Health Centre at LSHTM. Dr. Biller's research interests lie on the intersection of gender-based violence, um, which includes interpersonal violence, interpersonal and domestic violence against women and among men who have sex with men, labour and sexual exploitation and child domestic work, and health and development. And she has a focus on prevention in low and middle income countries. So our presentation today will last for about 40 minutes, half an hour to 40 minutes. So we'll have quite a lot of time for a Q and for a Q and A at the end. So we'd warmly welcome you. Um, so yeah, Anna Maria and Marjorie will do the Q and A together. We'll warmly welcome you to use the chat box that you should see on your screen to enter questions for the presenters. And you can do this both during the presentation and during the Q and A. But we'll answer all the questions at the end. Um, we're hoping to have a really lively discussion after what promises to be a fascinating presentation. And just so you know, we'll be recording the webinar and we'll upload it to the Linear YouTube channel so you can go back and look at it again later. Um, we will be able to take the questions in, uh, in writing, but also if you have a microphone, you'll be able to um, say your questions out loud. But please remember to keep yourself muted during the presentation and when other people are asking questions. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Marjorie. All right, um, thank you very much. Um, as Lati said, my name is Marjorie Pichon and I'm a researcher at LSHTM and I'm also one of the authors of the manuscript titled Social Norms Linked to the Sexual Exploitation of Children and Adolescents, a Global Systematic Review. I'd like to start off by acknowledging the co-authors on this review, um, Dr. Anna Maria Buller, um, Alice McAlpine, Dr. Ben Chislagi, Dr. Laurie Heisey, and Rebecca Meekson. Um, and this review has gone through the first round of comments um, at Child Abuse and Neglect, and we're hoping to hear back soon. So uh, I'm going to start with a background on um, brief, giving a brief background of sexual exploitation of children and adolescents, um, which I'll refer to from now on as SECA. I'm then going to discuss the aim of the systematic review, the analytical framework we use to guide conceptualization of the project and our coding. Um, I will then provide details about the search methods and criteria that we used and how we coded the data, and then go into the results. So discussing um, the included studies, we identified three factual beliefs. Um, descriptive norms, six injunctive norms, um, some of which were universal and other context specific, three attitudes, and then the theme of intersecting marginalized conditions and identities that increase vulnerability to SECA, which arose inductively from the data. And then I'll end with a discussion of our findings, the limitations of this research, and implications for interventions and future research. So, millions of children and adolescents have been sexually exploited worldwide. While significant resources are mobilized to address SECA, most services focus on supporting the recovery and rehabilitation of child survivors, on the justice response, and on awareness raising about the issue. 
These are all focused on the individual, but knowledge and research suggests that intervention should address all environmental systems, including societal cultural values. The purpose of this systematic review, the first of its kind, is to specifically identify and synthesize data from the past 10 years on social norms, attitudes, and factual beliefs that have been linked in the global literature with SECA. Um, with the goal of informing future efforts to understand, reduce, and respond appropriately to SECA. So there's no agreed upon universally used definition of SECA. Um, and so for our research, we chose to use the 2017 UK Department of Education definition, as we felt that it was both specific and comprehensive. So the definition reads, SECA occurs where an individual or group takes advantage of an imbalance of power to coerce, manipulate, or deceive a child or young person under the age of 18 into sexual activity, A, in exchange for something the victim needs or wants, and or B, for the financial advantage or increased status of the perpetrator or facilitator. The victim may have been sexually exploited even if the sexual activity appears consensual, um, and child sexual exploitation does not always involve physical contact. It can also occur through the use of technology. Um, so it's this aspect of exchange that distinguishes exploitation from other forms of abuse, and this use of technology bit at the end is one of the main updates from the previous 2009 definition, and there is increasing rec recognition of and research on this issue. So, to guide our analysis, we drew on the reasoned action approach to create an analytical framework that situates factual beliefs as an influence on descriptive norms, injunctive norms, and attitudes, highlighting how these factors work together to influence SECA behavior. We use this analytical framework to guide our coding and interpretation. Um, so factual beliefs are defined as an acceptance that something is true about the world. So for example, children who go to school are generally more successful than those that don't. Descriptive norms on the top is defined as people's beliefs about what others do in their setting or what others in their setting do. So for example, people in my group send their children to school, while injunctive norms are people's beliefs about the extent to which others in their setting approve of a given behavior. So for example, people in my group disapprove of those who do not send their children to school. Attitudes are people's personal preferences, judgments, or evaluations about something. For example, I'd rather send my children to school than not send them to school. Um, so for the systematic review, we searched five bibliographic databases, Global Health, IBSS, Popline, Social Services Abstracts, and Sociological Abstracts. We also consulted 15 experts from nine organizations and searched for gray literature using Google and NGO websites and hand searched internal study or internal study database um, for articles. We conducted the first search on March 13, 2016, and then updated again this year on January 9th. And we used key search terms referring to children or adolescents and sexual exploitation. Our inclusion criteria included articles published between 2009 and 2019, written in English, that disaggregated findings on people 19 and younger. Um, and we chose to go with 19 instead of 18, like the UK Department of Education definition, um, because we found a lot of research on adolescents up to the age of 19, and we didn't want to exclude relevant findings. Um, we also included articles um, and research conducted in any setting, as long as they presented findings on norms, attitudes, or beliefs related to SECA. We excluded data from experts, which included police officers and case, case managers, um, research that did not describe sampling methods, studies that were case studies and autoethnographies, um, research that did not um, explicitly describe an exchange for sex, and data that was not disaggregated for those over and under 19 or for those that were trafficked for sex versus labor purposes.
So the team screened over 5,000 sources. Um, 1,363 duplicates were removed and 3,239 were excluded at the title and abstract screening level. This left us with 451 articles to full text screen. We were able to exclude 396 at this stage, mostly based on the initial eligibility criteria. We were unable to find the full text of five articles that were excluded. We also retroactively excluded three studies that did not have any key findings that came up thematically in the other studies. Um, so that left us with a final inclusion comprising of 55 papers representing 49 studies. Um, we coded the data both deductively and inductively. Um, we deductively developed a coding framework a priori that was guided by the review aim and analytic framework that I described earlier, as well as extensive scoping of the literature. And then we inductively um, thematically analyzed codes as they emerge from the data, iteratively adapting the framework. And as I mentioned earlier, an additional theme of intersection between SECA and other forms of marginalization came up. Um, and I'll go into more depth about that later on. Um, so the included studies um, included over 14,000 participants with a mean of 287 participants per study. They came from 37 countries covering almost all world regions. The most well-represented countries were the United States with 12 studies, Thailand with five studies, and South Africa with four studies. And the majority of studies use qualitative methods, so 28 of them, and purposive or convenience sampling. Many papers were on sexual health more generally and weren't specifically on SECA. Um, the studies also usually did not specifically set out to address social norms. Um, and so we had to rely on authors' descriptions of their findings to identify the social norms, attitudes, and factual beliefs pertaining to SECA within them. And the boundaries between these categories were not always clear. Um, and given the secondary analysis nature of our exercise, it was sometimes difficult to differentiate between them. Um, so we referred back to our analytical framework often to help with that. So here are the types of SECA included in the review, um, child and adolescent marriage, pornography and live stream cyber sex, sex tourism, sexual trafficking, commercial SECA, informal sexual exchange, and intergenerational sex, also known as cross-generational age, age disparate or age mixing sex. Findings on CSECA and informal sexual exchange were the most well explored in the literature and few studies addressed child and adolescent marriage, pornography and live streaming, and sexual trafficking. So here's an overview of all of our results organized within our analytical framework. Um, so first we'll look more closely at the factual beliefs on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, and so we identified three factual beliefs. The first was that study participants believe that children and adolescents' readiness for sex is determined solely by age or physical development. Um, so, for example, in Brazil, participants reported that they saw people who had sex with children and adolescents aged 12 to 14 years as animals crazy and sick but they were more understanding if the adolescent was 15 or 16 years old. In regard to physical development, a 14 to 18 year old um, in school girl in the US said, you got 10 year olds and 11 year olds out there. Like right after a girl receives her period, she can be sent out by a PIP for sex work. Participants also reported believing that men have powerful sexual urges that are hard for them to resist. Across many contexts, masculinities were conceptualized as being driven by a biologically determined desire for sex under all circumstances. So for example, in Brazil, um, a study on SECA, CSECA reported, some respondents referred to biological determinants. Men consume sex based on their alleged natural tendency and propensity to satisfy their sexual instincts. Similarly, in Tanzania, 
a father reportedly said, it is a normal thing for a man to seduce a girl, and it is not easy for a man to stop trying again and again, even if a girl refuses him. The third factual belief that we identified was that intergenerational relationships can be beneficial for both parties. So in Brazil, men reported that younger partners offered greater sexual satisfaction and feelings of shared youthfulness. In Tanzania, they were believed to be less likely to have HIV. In the Dominican Republic, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Spain, we also found beliefs that young people benefit from the maturity, wisdom, and financial security of older partners. For example, a study on transactional sex among adolescents in South Africa found that respondents express the derivation of sexual pleasure from old men because they comfort them. They further emphasize that older men are more compassionate in comparison to boyfriends their own age. So next, we will move on from factual beliefs and look at descriptive norm results at the top. So just to remind you, descriptive norms are people's beliefs about what others in their setting do. And beliefs about how common SECA is varied widely but, um, in different settings. So a study on men who had bought sex in the UK, for example, found that men who bought sex thought that on average 36% of sex workers began selling sex before the age of 18. Um, a study on attitude towards sexually exploited children and adolescents in Central and Eastern Europe found that Bulgaria stands out with the highest perceived prevalence of all forms of commercial exploitation, from 64% to 71%. Now let's turn to the six injunctive norms that we identified. As a reminder, injunctive norms are people's beliefs about the extent to which others in their setting approve of a given behavior. So the first injunctive norm we found was that sexually exploited young people are stigmatized by their communities. This norm was very common across all regions included in the review and especially prominent in literature addressing CSECA. Manifestations, um, it manifested itself in various ways ranging from internalized stigma such as feelings of isolation, guilt, dirtiness, and shame among young people who sold sex to discrimination, violence, and other abuses from peers, families, communities, and society. As exemplified by the first quote from a child who had been sexually exploited in Nepal, and she said, most of the time family does not support prostituted children. They say, you are dirty, you have done this and that, so we cannot keep you in the family. We found that stigma could perpetuate SECA in various ways, including by acting as a barrier to stopping selling sex, seeking help or returning to school. For example, a 14 to 9 year old, 19 year old who had been commercially sexually exploited in the US said, I was scared of what people were was going to think. So I didn't really ask nobody for help or nothing. I was pretty much on my own. It could also put young people's future prospects at risk, making it difficult for them to get a good job or get married. And this injunctive norm was related to the factual belief that men have powerful sexual urges that are hard for them to resist as it can place the blame for SECA on the girls <coughs> and women who quote unquote tempt them. The second injunctive norm that we found was that perpetrators of SECA are socially tolerated by their communities. Again, this norm came up repeatedly across different regions. We found some evidence that men that perpetrate SECA are called derogatory names, but very little evidence of strong social consequences for them. This double standard was highlighted on a quote, um, in a quote from a girl who sold sex in Bangladesh when she said, people spit at us, but at night their father, uncle, brothers come to sleep with us. There is no punishment for them. Blame for SECA was reportedly sometimes placed on children and adolescents and other times on parents, but we didn't find any evidence of blame being placed on perpetrators. This quote from a study on SECA in Tanzania exemplifies this, um, when, where they said, while girls and adults all agreed that pressure and expectations for men are strong determinants of girls' sexual behavior, many adults did not fault men. 
many adult participants place the bulk of the blame on the girls for not finding a way to avoid the pressure and risk. And this norm was related to all three factual beliefs that I mentioned earlier. So children and adolescents readiness for sex is determined solely by their age and physical development, which suggests that men's sexual exploitation is socially acceptable if those criteria are met. The second was men have powerful sexual urges that are hard for them to resist, suggesting they are not to blame for their sexual behavior. And that's biologically determined. And the third was that intergenerational relationships can be beneficial for both parties, um, suggesting that their participation in SECA can actually be perceived as a good thing. The third injunctive norm that we identified was that young people face social pressure from community members to be sexually active. Studies in South Korea, Thailand, and Sub-Saharan Africa found evidence that young people face social pressure not only from men in their communities, but also from their peers in the media. For example, a study on young people in vulnerable groups in Thailand found friends give them pride. They can be admired if they can achieve something that the group values as cool. For instance, if one can score a large number of boys or girls to have sex with within a short period of time, he or she can become the group's hero. The fourth injunctive norm was that community members expect the exchange of sex for favors. Several studies from across Sub-Saharan Africa addressing informal sexual exchange found that money, gifts, sex, and love were intertwined. Boys reported not being able to have girlfriends because they couldn't meet their demands for gifts, while girls reported being unable to re refuse sex after giving gifts, or after receiving gifts, excuse me. So for example, a 15 to 16-year-old six year old schoolgirl in Ghana said, immediately, once the boy starts to buy you gifts, the boy will ask you to have sex with him. This led community members to blame girls for Seka because they accepted gifts. For example, an adult woman in Tanzania said, she shouldn't accept gifts and things from him. She should know he will expect her to have sex if she takes money and gifts from him. The fifth injunctive norm that we identified was that young people who own certain goods have higher status among their peers. Studies from low and middle income countries in Africa and Asia, as well as the USA, found that material goods like fashionable clothes, mobile phones, and cosmetics were associated with social mobility and status. And young people sometimes exchanged sex for these goods to meet social expectations. For example, a study on sexual exchange among students in Nigeria found that girls reported being directly pressured by friends to attain social standing through the goods available to them through sexual exchange. The girls frequently spoke of envying their peers' material possessions and putting pressures on pressure on themselves to have things like their peers in order to be up to the level or have higher social status. Last injunctive norm that we identified was that young people are expected by their communities to contribute financially to their families. Studies from the Dominican Republic, Egypt, Nigeria, Tanzania, and Thailand indicated community expectations that young people would contribute financially to support either themselves or their families. In situations with little opportunity for work, this could lead young people to exchange sex for money. For example, a study on short-term child and adolescent marriages in Egypt reported that in families that range from seven to 11 members and have an unstable monthly income of 75 to $150 a month, daughters view this type of relationship as an opportunity to sacrifice for the family and help them financially. Most often these expectations were described in the context of poverty. And so it's not clear to what extent they were underpinned by social sanctions and attitudes about what is appropriate as opposed to by material need. So lastly, I will turn to attitudes um, and we identified three of them at the bottom of the screen. We found um, that these underpin the norms and factual beliefs that I described earlier. So the first was a general disapproval of the commercial sexual exploitation of children and adolescents. And this was, a found, this was found across all regions included in the review. So community members, tourists, and the children and adolescents selling sex all share this negative attitude. 
For example, a 36-year-old female Australian tourist that had recently traveled to Southeast Asia said, I saw an older Western man with several young girls on the beach. It looked very suspect and I felt sickened. I didn't feel I could do anything to help. I found it very confronting and disturbing, so much so that I don't think I would return. So this attitude underpinned the universal social norm that children and adolescents involved in SECA are stigmatized by their communities. As CSECA is something that is found um, to bring up very strong negative reactions. The second attitude that we identified was the acceptance of SECA when used as a way to provide for oneself or family. So while generally SECA generated disapproval, as I mentioned earlier, participants in several studies, including some young people who sold sex, reported that they accepted SECA as a way to meet individual and household needs. For example, a young gay man who sold sex in Niger said, I'm not complaining at all. I live my life fully. Nothing in the world can make me change this life. While a study on child sex tourism in Thailand found that the children felt that pro prostituting themselves with the right intentions meant, there were, meant that there was no moral opprobrium attached to what they did. This attitude was closely linked to the norm that young people were expected to contribute financially to the family. And like that norm, this was mostly seen in contexts of poverty. The third attitude that we identified was the acceptance of SECA when it occurs with older or more physically developed children or adolescents. The age of the child seemed to influence the assignment of blame for SECA in Brazil. For example, a man from Brazil said, if a 12-year-old girl or younger is prostituting herself, it must be out of necessity. Now, if she's older, that happens because she wants to. While well, a study on cross-generational relationships in Uganda found that any consensual sex involving a post-pubescent post -pubescent girl is seen as culturally acceptable and normal adult relationship. In other words, cross-generational sex is not in any way problematized. This attitude was closely linked to the factual belief that children and adolescents' readiness for sex is determined solely by their age and physical development. The factual belief that intergenerational relationships can be beneficial for both parties and the norm of social tolerance for perpetrators of SECA. And this is because men that perpetrated SECA were not always seen to be causing the girl harm. So as I mentioned earlier, we also found a theme that emerged during the analysis and had not been identified a priori, and that was of intersecting marginalized conditions and identities that increase vulnerability to SECA. And this section was included because it revealed social norms that although relatively distant from SECA, shape vulnerability to SECA and therefore fit within the aim of this review. Findings from all regions covered in this review suggest that marginalized young people are particularly vulnerable to sexual exploitation and the ways that societies construct, construct and engage with different conditions, such as social class, homelessness, pregnancy and disability, and identities such as sexual and gender identity and ethnicity, could increase vulnerability to SECA. For example, a woman in Mexico who had entered sex work at 16 explained how the social consequences of a stigmatized teenage pregnancy had left her vulnerable and homeless. Um, so she said, I was raped and I got pregnant. My father, instead of helping me, kicked me out of the house. I slept in the sidewalks and a woman who owned the bar, she picked me up and she sold me, so forced her into sex work. Um, and so there are some limitations of this research. Uh, first of all, the studies in this review did not set out to investigate social norms, as I mentioned. They did, however, set out to investigate SECA or sexual health. And our goal was to widen the interpretation of the results of these studies using a social norms theory lens. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the distinction between social norms, attitudes, and factual beliefs were not always clear and we had to rely on authors' interpretations of the results, um, but we did have an analytical framework to help guide this work. There was also a lack of geographic and population diversity. So 12 of the included studies were conducted in the US, despite this being a less affected area 
Um, and this means that more social norms, attitudes, and factual beliefs probably exist in other locations and among other populations, um, and they haven't yet been researched. Lastly, providing country-specific social norms was outside the scope of this review. Instead, this systematic review provides a broad overview of norms identified across the world. Practitioners interested in creating regionally tailored prevention programs should consult literature about the country of interest including studies published in the local language when developing interventions. So despite these limitations, there are significant intervention implications of this work. Social norms interventions are needed that consider the general norms driving SECA, such as male entitlement to sex, but also the specific norms driving the practice at the local level. They should also address bundles of norms and how they interact while keeping in mind structural factors. In addition, individ individual interventions are still needed and they should aim to help young people identify and achieve long-term life aspirations, as well as educate and support young people to make informed sexual decisions. During the systematic review, we also identified some gaps in the literature. Um, and future research should explore these. Um, so more research is needed on the sexual exploitation of boys, men's experiences of social norms around SACA and how they can be engaged to promote protective norms around sex, and context-specific descriptive norms surrounding SACA and how they connect to the behaviors of both young people and those who sexually exploit them. Um, so here are some references that I'm happy to share. Um, and thank you so much for listening in. We're happy to take questions now. I will start with the, um, with the first question, which is from Susanna Davies, while other people are um, uh, sharing their questions. And she says, um, all of your quotes and examples seem to focus on the exploitation of girls by men. Were there any results that explored the social norms related to sexual exploitation of boys or children of diverse gender identities? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so as I mentioned in research implications, we do need more research on the sexual exploitation of boys. There's very little out there. There was one quote that I shared from a young gay man who had sold sex in Niger. Um, and there were a couple, so that was one study that focused specifically on boys, and I believe there was one that focused on transgendered young people in the U.S., um, but those were the only two that we found. Um, so there's definitely a big need for research in that area, and it is, um, a, I, I believe there is a lot more interest um, in that and um, funding is headed in that direction. Yeah, and something, I think something that we also found is that, um, but we decided not to include in this review is the, the area of, of health services research. And we did find some sections on some studies that Marjorie has mentioned <coughs> on the attitudes of health service providers for uh, boys that had been affected. Um, and they were, they, they had to do a lot with sort of gender norms and internalized ideas of who should be a victim and who should be a perpetrator. But we didn't include all that because we weren't looking at health services. And it was, again, there wasn't a lot about that, but we definitely found some um, indications on that kind of, of um, information. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we've got another question from Laura Houston, who is kind of related to this one, but she was asking whether you found any norms specific to women perpetrators or female perpetrators. No, we don't see anything on that, and it certainly does exist. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Again, I think I think we we didn't find any of that in this review uh, specifically. But again, if you look at more grey literature, for example, on um, sex tourism. And there's a lot of NGOs or organizations like EPAC working on sex tourism that have looked at the experiences of boys. And you, nobody has concentrated actually on looking at the norms specifically like that, but they do mention aspects of how, again, how society and people don't see boys as being possible being potential victims of, 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 of sexual exploitation and they are seen normally as 
actually they are learning because um, they are having sexual experiences with older women and that for them is sort of a learning experience rather than exploitation. So we've seen that or certainly in other literature, but as I'm saying, in a lot of the great literature and less on the uh, published literature, and so it didn't make it to the, to the review. Great. We've got a number of questions on intervention, so we'll turn to them now. Yeah. Uh, one's from Rachel Marcus who says, I understand that you weren't looking specifically at interventions, but did you get any insights around effective strategies for changing social norms that affect SECA? And then there's a related one which um, from Kate McAlpine, which says, did you find anything on the norms surrounding prevention or response of SECA by citizens? Okay, any other thing on prevention? Um, I think, yeah, those are two on intervention, okay. and then there's one more on social norms, so we'll come back to that. Um, effective strategies for treating social norms. No, so most of the studies that we included did not look specifically at social norms and even less on strategies to change social norms. I think that'd be a different. Yeah, I mean, again, sure. again, not as part of, of the review, um, yeah. but I think the result that the, what, what these results show is, well, number one, I think in terms of strategy, one of the first implications is that because we are finding similar norms across different contexts, we can think about interventions that can, that can be used um, um, to tackle those norms at different levels. Obviously, they will need adaptation. But I think two of the sort of universal norms we found, if you remember what Marjorie was saying at the beginning, is that there's stigmatization of, of the children involved in, in sexual exploitation and lack of um, so social sanctions of the perpetrators. And the lack of social sanctions of the perpetrators had to do a lot with this idea that men cannot control their instincts and cannot sort of help themselves when they are being lured into into um, into into these um, relationships or acts, so I think there's a, a an important uh, avenue for interventions in terms of gender transformative approaches that sort of allow people to reflect and on the on the role that adults and specifically men in this case that we are talking about men with younger girls play in, um, in in these relationships or in these acts. Um, there's also a strong, um, inf and, and again, a lot of, um, of social norms need to be shifted around the idea of, I guess, the agency of the children involved in this, um, in exploitation, uh, because the if a girl looks like a woman, then immediately society seems to stop seeing her as a girl and, and stop, start seeing her as a woman that is ready for, to have sex. So um, I think the norm around how we need to make, to shift the norm or to sort of create more awareness that um, getting involved in sex is not just about how girls look, but also um, it has to do with a cognitive development and it also has to do with their um, with the legal uh, frameworks in each country and when they are ready to uh, to accept to have sex or not. So I think if if we didn't we didn't do a review on the prevention side of things because that's what we were not looking on uh, looking at. I think the results show avenues for um, for interventions. And the last thing I want to say is that what we know then sort of putting together the world of social norms with our results is that we know that. Uh, Active interventions around norms, um, more and more we are seeing that entertainment or media interventions seem to have or seem to, to be a good way of creating these shifts. So, um, so I think that that could be an avenue to sort of create plots or create uh, entertainment that has storylines that incorporate these norms and try to reflect and create critical reflection of these issues. Great, thank you. I've got this question from Sarah Morgan and um, it says that um, she said that overall there's still a lack of rigorous evidence on social norms 
in this area and I think she means in the field of research on SECA. Um, so she was asking if there are some, I think she means um, are there er other areas of research outside of social norms where people are on SECA which is stronger? That are not, well if I'm interpreting the yeah. question rightly I think, for example, the area of child marriage is where we know a lot more or a lot more work on social norms has been done. Uh, that's for sure. I think child marriage is one that has been properly, uh, FGM as well, was one of the origi original sort of harmful practices that were uh, looked at through the lens of social norms. Um, yeah, those are the ones I, I know mm. about. Okay, let's move to this next question, um, which I think is really interesting. And Laura Houston's asked again um, about how many of the studies were from the perspective of the survivors themselves. And also she's asking um, whether there were any patterns explaining to what extent the survivors had internalised norms and attitudes, the norms and attitudes which you've discussed in this presentation. So maybe we'll start with the first one about how many um, how many of the studies were from the perspective of survivors? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there were there there were a lot of different perspectives included in the review. So we did have quite a few from the perspective of survivors, and um, there were a lot from ECPAT and like other gray literature in particular that looked really um, deeply at that. There is also some studies from the the perspectives of the perpetrators, um, as well as like some tourism studies, so from the perspective of, of tourists, and I think the majority were just from community members. So we did get a lot, a wide range of perspectives. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think there were some evidence of, of the survivors or the children uh, internalizing the fact that because they've been part, they had taken part in this kind of activities, they were now tainted or someone mm -hmm. were, it somehow was their fault. Uh, but there wasn't a lot of analysis going in depth in those sort of stories, stories of the of the survivors. And I think it has to do a lot as well with how hard it is to to get to to talk to this population and how hard it is also to conduct research and publish it in terms of ethics and um, and issues like that. But yeah, many of the quotes that have been included comes from the perspective of the survivors. Yeah. So we probably don't have enough data at this site at this stage to see patterns regionally or within age groups. No, no, definitely not age groups. Definitely not. I think there was there was a lack of enough numbers to be able to sort of define um define age groups mm -hmm. in terms of regional patterns i guess more than regional i would say that there will be a difference between lower middle income countries and high income countries and that has to do with issues around structural determinants such as poverty and given that some of the norms we found had to do with po were linked with poverty for instance um norms around the family members, young women, things like that, so you could establish some differences or you could see some norms more prevalent or more present in lower middle-income countries as opposed to high income. I think that's as far as we could tease out from the data. Great, so the next question is from Adam um, and he's asking about the lack of social sanctions for perpetrators as a social norm, which is one of the key findings from this um, uh, review. So he was wondering if this went any further to look at social norms which impact on the level of reporting um, of abuse to authorities like the police or other services. Was there anything about that in the data? So how do you think we, there's a kind of a social norm around the well, and then Well, I guess, yeah, I mean, the lack, it's, it's I, I guess, yeah, the tolerance of, of, I would say that the one that links with masculinities and the idea that 
it's almost like men cannot control themselves have to do with the reporting because it's almost like they are not seen as um as being in charge or being guilty of and i think the other one that has to do with it is the norm about how people believe it's a belief actually how um that age disparate relationships are beneficial mm -hmm. for both parties so i guess but those two impact on the level of reporting because they they show that people don't necessarily think that it's um a negative a negative situation so i think that definitely will have an impact on on um on the level of reporting we know from again going to other data because um this this doesn't include all studies obviously but um we know from other data in in some in some countries for instance there is um there is fear of reporting because people feel like that will have an impact on the community relations because everybody would know that someone reported someone else and then um they are trying to sort of just keep keep to themselves and don't um not necessarily sort of meddle because it'll be but again it didn't come up a lot in this review and and what i'm talking about is more specific to transactional sex which is a more normalized uh, behavior so maybe that's why it didn't come with these other same behaviors we included here thank you um, if anyone else has any questions, we'd welcome uh, welcome you to put them in the chat box. Um, but I've got a question that I might ask you both, um, which is at the beginning, Marjorie, you asked about, you mentioned that, um, because there's been kind of two stages to this review and doing the research, and um, some of the uh, key new papers that came up in the second round were about sexual exploitation using the internet and uh, the use of technology. And I think we discussed earlier that it's probably not shifted kind of the norms more generally that you found but i was wondering if either of you could kind of make any projections about changes that we might see as more data is available about sexual exploitation over the internet or using the internet and kind of trends that we might see well i guess i think the issue of the of, of the internet it's a bit I think that in, not just in this area, but in general, social norms and, and the internet, it's a, a whole area that we need to understand a bit better because a lot of the, a key component of social norms have to do with the visibility of behaviors, right? And if you, if you, think, you think that it's happening because you see others in the community doing something, and I wonder how that's, how, what the mechanism is for diffusion of that in social media because it's all such a personalized experience of individuals so we know bullying is happening we know a lot of harmful behavior is happening but it's happening um virtually um so you can see i mean if you leave comments to something obviously everybody else can see what's happening there but i would think that a lot of these behaviors happen very one-to-one -one because they are not legal for instance so i don't know how that will correlate with social norms mm. because it's covered um but it will be interesting in on the flip side i think from the point of from the point of view of prevention especially if we are talking about children and adolescents it'll be interesting as well to try and think how you utilize these platforms to actually create awareness and prevent and discuss these issues and make them more mainstream so children can know how to sort of be more aware or or, or recognize signs and and look for help mm -hmm. um yeah so i think with with technology we we need to look at both sides so it probably yes it potentially sort of increases the risk of exploitation but at the same time it could be a very beneficial platform to successfully reach children and adolescents and prevent. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we've, there aren't any more questions as far as I can tell from the um, participants. If anyone has anything they'd like to add, go ahead now, or otherwise we'll wrap up. Um, unless either of you have anything else that you'd like to add at the stage before we finish.
Yeah. No, I think, I think, thank you for those interesting questions. I think what's clear from the review is that this is a nascent area and what we really wanted to achieve with the review is to try to, to, to have a first approach to social norms and, and sexual exploitation of children to hopefully uh, highlight the gaps and then um, hopefully you, you all that are interested in this topic can bring some of these norms and some of these insights and also recognize where the gaps are and try to incorporate in your work. Uh, and that would be really good for us. And, and if you have more questions, you can always send us Marjorie or myself emails and um, we will post the slides and the recording on the linear channel so you can always revisit if, if it's of interest. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Anna Maria and Marjorie. And uh, yes, we'll be sharing the slides and the video like Anna Maria said. So yeah, um, keep, keep your eyes peeled for those, that information. Thank you very much. Bye.